Today we come to the book of Psalms. We are in Psalm 71, and we pick up our study in verse 17, going through Psalm 73, verse 14. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 71, verse 17. I will come, whoops, that's verse 16, let's read it. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Since my youth, O God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. In other words, God, you've been with me, helping me since I was little. And I've always told others about all the wonderful things you've done for me. And that must be pleasing to God. It must please God, who does good things for everyone, to hear those he has helped acknowledge that to others. Verse 18. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. In other words, God, give me time on earth to tell this generation and the next generation about all your great miracles, about how good you are. As wonderful as heaven will be, it is only natural for God's people to want to stick around and be used by God for as long as they possibly can. 19. Your righteousness reaches to the skies, O God. You who have done great things, who, O God, is like you? In other words, if you could measure God's goodness and His power by feet, the yardstick would have to reach into outer space and beyond. 20. Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once again. He says, in spite of my desperate situation and the horrible problems that I'm facing, I know that God will restore me and make things better. No matter how low we fall as Christians, good times are coming. That is, that's a guarantee. Blessings are on the way. If not here, then in eternity. 22. I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praise to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. He says, I'm going to praise you with music. I will use music to tell of your faithfulness and of your holiness. You know, I believe that's why God made certain people musical. God invented music. And people with the gift of music should use that gift to honor God. They should use their gift to honor God, but should never use God in music to draw attention to themselves. Look at verse 23. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. I, whom you have redeemed. He says, I'm going to praise you for redeeming me. And if a person can't get excited about being redeemed from hell, if that can't get them shouting to God with thanksgiving, then what in the world can? 24. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. For those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion. In other words, all who tried to hurt me have been brought to disgrace. And that is what happened to those who would do you harm and would not repent of it. When God Almighty is on your side. Let's go into Psalm 72. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. Now this is Solomon who wrote Psalm 72. And when Solomon took over as king, he really had a heart for God. 
He wanted to be godly in character, and he wanted to run the country the exact way God would. And no matter what our job may be, our prayer should be, God, let me do it as you would do it. Verse 2. He will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. The most important job any civil leader has is to do everything that they can do to make sure the country is run on righteous principles. That is why they are in that position of leadership. And that includes watching out for the poor and those who have no influence. Watching out, making sure that they also are treated fairly. And that's a tough thing to do. That's a tough job. Verse 3. The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. His first prayer was to rule with righteousness. And then he builds on that. And he says, God, would you prosper us because of our righteousness? Goal number one for God's people should always be holiness. Once that's there, once that's the goal, the main goal, then a person can start thinking about asking for other things. Four. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. One of the main reasons God established civil government is to crush oppressive people. God wants civil government to punish those who would hurt the innocent. And if they're not doing that, they are not operating operating under God's leadership. Verse 5. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. Now, he's not asking if he can stay on earth forever. What he is asking for is that the poor and the needy would respect God for as long as the earth remains. God has a special concern for the poor and the needy, but they are still expected to fear Him. 6. He will be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. And So He is asking for His rain in Israel to be fruitful to be prosperous. Every good parent wants their children's lives to be better than their own. And he's asking for prosperity and holiness and blessing to continue on. Verse 7 In his days the righteous will flourish. Prosperity will abound till the moon is no more. And so he is asking for good men to be blessed during his reign if we are a blessing to good people then we know that we're on the right track and we have something to be thankful for verse 8 he will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth a large flourishing kingdom would be a sign of God's favor God's favor would be the result of obedience to God Godly people want to succeed, not at the expense of godliness, but as the outgrowth of godliness. Verse 9. The desert tribes will bow before him, and his enemies will lick the dust. Victory over enemies would also be a sign of God's favor, with Israel anyway, back in Old Testament days. Verse 10. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him, and all nations will serve him. God promised Israel that if they would obey him, he would make them the head and the nations around them the tail, and that other nations would serve them as a result of their obedience to God. And it's important for us to remember that God never promised those sorts of things to the, to the United States or to Christians, it's important to separate the promises made to Abraham and the patriarchs and specifically to the Israelites. Separate those promises from the promises that God made to the church. 
a Christian's reward is promised in eternity. That's when it's going to be given. It's promised for eternity. Not necessarily for this life. God may choose to bless in this life, but he doesn't necessarily promise it. These promises are for the nation Israel. 12. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. God takes care of the helpless when they pray to him for help. He takes care of those who have no one else to help them. He'll find some way to help them. Maybe stir the kind the, the kind heart of some person out there to provide what they need. Verse 13. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. The reason God helps the weak and needy is that He has pity on them. God feels sorry for people who are going through rough times. Especially those who no one else cares about. 14. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in His sight. In other words, their lives are valuable to Him. Sinful man can be pretty cold toward the down and out. Pretty cold toward the poor. And they may be unimportant to some. But the down and out, the poor, they are very important to God. They are as important as anyone else. 15. Long may he live. May the gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. Now, he would like popularity. Again, not for popularity's sake and not popularity at the expense of godliness, but popularity because of godliness. Remember, God wanted to bless His Old Testament people, Israel, so that other nations would take notice and then be drawn to the God of Israel. But if holiness is not at the core of one's character then any popularity is meaningless. If a person is popular and they are not holy, the popularity, no doubt, comes from the wrong type of people. They are admired by the wrong type of people. 16. Let grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. Let its fruit flourish like Lebanon. Let it shrive like the grass of the field. He prays for cities full of people. Many, especially people from rural areas, I suppose think of a densely populated city and say, no thank you. Not for me. All that filth, all that crime, all that immorality. But if a nation is sold out to God, I would think a large city would have a lot of good things to offer, even for a even for a country person. Can you imagine? A large city, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, with little or no sin at all? It would be a wonderful place. Verse 17. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Blessed. May his name be honored forever. History does not honor evil sinners. It honors good people. How many people do you know that are named Cain? Or Adolf? Or Judas? I've never met a Cain, an Adolf, or a Judas in my life. Not many girls are called Jezebel either. But there sure are a lot of Marys and a lot of Josephs, and Peters, and James, and John. Verse 18. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. The only thing that God does is marvelous deeds, wonderful things. Don't ever blame God for the bad in your life, for the bad in this world. God does not initiate bad. God does not promote bad. 
In fact, God is busy squeezing bad and trying to wring out a few drops of good. And He only does good things. 19. Praise be to His glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen and Amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. And what a great day that will be when the whole earth reflects the glory of God, unhindered by the stain of sin in nature or in man. What a wonderful place this is going to be. The new heavens, the new earth. And I know there are plenty of good things to enjoy. We enjoy good things. But someday, we're going to look back and we're going to wonder how we could stand living on this earth at this time compared to the way it will be. Psalm 73, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. God is good to those whose hearts are pure. They are called the upright. No one is good all the time, but the upright have a heart for God. They want to do what is right. That's really a big difference between the saved and the unsaved. Verse 2, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Something had the writer, right on the edge of falling to pieces, spiritually speaking. Verse 3, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He started to envy the success and the good times that the wicked were enjoying. Boy, that, that is a fast track to depression. A lot of depression is caused by people wanting something that someone else has. And they go through life and they waste the good that God has given them. A lot of depression caused by people wanting something that someone else has, especially when one thinks that they are more worthy to have it than the one who does. Four. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. In other words, their whole life is nothing but a long, smooth road. And of course, no one has it that good. But when a person is envious, that's the way they think. Makes them even more depressed. Five. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. They don't have problems like everyone else. Often that is true of the wicked because they're not bucking the ungodly ways of this world but instead are flowing right along with it. So they do. They do escape a lot of the problems that godly people have to endure. 6. Therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. And so since they seem to be getting away with their sinful life, they're full of pride and they're full of cruelty. People like that do not understand that God's goodness and his patience toward them is for the purpose of leading them to repentance. Verse 7 From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They seem to have everything they could possibly want. That's the way it appears on the surface but they're missing God. Which means, no matter how it looks on the surface, there's a gap in their life. You can bet it. It's there. 8. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. God and eternity are jokes to the arrogantly wicked who seem to be getting away with their evil. It's just a joke. They scoff at God. They threaten His people. They persecute his people. Since they have a good today, they feel as if they're totally invincible. Nothing to worry about. No respect for God at all. Verse 9. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Heaven's here is just another name for God. They boast against God. They don't take him seriously. They sit around boast about how they don't need God they just do not respect God at all 10 
therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance in other words people often get caught up in the success of the ungodly and people often drink in all their boasting and really do believe that they have their act together that's why there are so many celebrities in the world ungodly celebrities who by example promote an ungodly unwholesome lifestyle sinful blatant sin and look how many people look up to them and just want to be like them they drink in all their boasting caught up in the success of the ungodly people who put an emphasis on worldly success look up to the successful and find absolutely no fault with their ungodly ways at all just totally overlook them because after all they're successful they're glamorous they're rich doesn't mean anything verse 11 they say how can God know does the most high have knowledge when the wicked prosper some people begin to wonder if God really knows what's going on people start to think maybe there isn't a God or if there is one maybe he doesn't care about much because why are the wicked prospering 12 this is what the wicked are like always carefree they increase in wealth it looks like the wicked have it made sometimes it really does he says they don't seem to work very hard their life is easy and yet your, their wealth just continues to increase and all that all that might be true sometimes there's no denying that I'm not going to say it's not true but no one should forget that this life is not everything there's a whole eternity out there yet to be verse 13 surely in vain have I kept my heart pure in vain have I washed my hands in innocence boy and you know you have to reel your mind back in line with the word of God when you look at the prosperity of the wicked and think I'm wasting my time why am I working so hard to stay pure time to get back in touch with God when you start thinking like that all day long I have been plagued I have been punished every morning seems like all I get out of living for God and trying to do the right thing is trouble every day it's the same old thing well we need to finish this psalm next time